Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, feel free to contribute to the icebreaker in the chat box and tell us where you like to hike or paddle and if you currently use IMAP invasives to report invasive species observations. Uh, we ask that you please mute your line. Uh, utilize the chat box for any questions you may have. We will pause briefly after each topic to answer them. Um, and this webinar is co-hosted by myself, Megan Pistoli, the Education Outreach Coordinator with Lilo Prism and Mitch O'Neill, the IMAP specialist with the New York Natural Heritage Program. I also just want to add that we do have Meg Wilkinson with the uh, New York IMAP Invasives, and she's in the chat box. She'll be monitoring the chat box for us. Thanks, Meg. So this webinar is intended to provide information to existing, new, and potential members of the Flelo Invasive Species Volunteer Surveillance Network. We would like to thank you as your efforts help stop the spread of invasive species. Today we'll cover how to set up and use the IMAP mobile app, tips and tricks to enhance your reporting efforts, invasives of concern in the Flelo region, and a story map that can be used to enhance early detection of, det of our targeted invasives. So although this may be a bit of review for some, uh, we've been and she's also going to give a live demo of this really cool story map that she's created to make uh, your life easier in uh, figuring out what species to look for, where are some good spots you might need to look for them. And this story map also has some resources on how to identify the species. And I just want to point out that um, the, uh, we have noticed that the symbology in the Zoom app and the WebEx app are different. So in the WebEx, you need to click the mic button and make sure it turns completely red to activate that mic being muted. And second, um, Mitchell, I don't notice that you set record. It is recording. Oh, interesting. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Meg. So today's agenda, so first I'm going to be giving an IMAP invasive training. So I'm going to teach you how to set up your account and use the mobile app if you haven't been able to do that before. And then Meg is going to talk about some key species to be looking out for in the Slilo region. And she's also going to give a live demo of this really cool story map that she's created to make uh, your life easier in uh, figuring out what species to look for, where are some good spots you might need to look for them. And the story map also has some resources on how to identify the species. And just as we're getting started, and just as we're getting started, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So we define invasive species as species of plants, animals, and insects, and pathogens that are one, non-native, so they're from somewhere else, and two, they have negative impacts. So that could be harm to the environment, the economy, human health. And I have a picture of hemlock woolly adelgid damage on the right, so that's an invasive insect that, and I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So we define invasive species as species of plants, animals, and insects, and pathogens that are one, non-native, so they're from somewhere else, and two, they have negative impacts, so that could be harm to the environment, the economy, or human health. And I have a picture of hemlock woolly adelgid damage on the right, so that's an invasive insect that damages hemlock trees, it lives on uh, the needle damages hemlock trees, it lives on uh, the needles and eventually kills the trees. So you can see all those sort of, they call them ghost trees, all those trees that have died and turned uh, gray. And it's a very kind of dramatic example of invasive species damage and the sort of impacts that they can have. 
So invasive species are a huge problem um, and eventually kills the trees. So you can see all those sort of, they call them ghost trees, all those trees that have died and turned uh, gray. And it's a very kind of dramatic example of uh, invasive species damage and the sort of impacts that they can have. So invasive species are a huge problem. Um, what can we do about them? So a lot of work has gone into trying to figure that what can we do about them? So a lot of work has gone into trying to figure that out. And the main idea is that what we do about invasive species depends on where they are in this invasion curve. So early on in the invasion, they might not even be here yet, or the invasive species might be here, but only in small clumps. So at that point, the focus would be on preventing the invasive species from coming or eradicating it in the small patches where it occurs out. And the main idea is that what we do about invasive species depends on where they are in this invasion curve. So early on in the invasion, they might not even be here yet, or the invasive species might be here, but only in small clumps. So at that point, the focus would be on preventing the invasive species from coming or eradicating it in the small patches where it occurs. Um, eventually, an invasive species will build its population, and um, eventually, an invasive species will build its population, and it'll get to a point where you can't eradicate it anymore. And at that point, the strategy would be containment. So you don't want, you want to contain the infestation, and you don't want it to spread to uninfested areas. And really, the main idea is that the earlier we are in this invasion curve, the better we are. So we really want to focus our efforts earliest on the case, on the curve as we can. It'll get to a point where you can't eradicate it anymore. And at that point, the strategy would be containment. So you don't want, you want to contain the infestation and you don't want it to spread to uninfested areas. And really, the main idea is that the earlier we are in this invasion curve, the better we are. So we really want to focus our efforts earliest on the case, on the curve as we can. And so to figure out where the species is on the curve, we really need to understand its distribution. So there's a real need for uh, tracking invasive species distributions. As an example, I have the hemlock lily adelgid distribution up on the screen. Um, as you can see, it's pretty well known in some southern areas of the state. Um, Slilo prism is the one prism that has and so to figure out where the species is on the curve, we really need to understand its distribution. So there's a real need for uh, tracking invasive species distributions. As an example, I have the hemlock lily adelgid distribution up on the screen. Um, as you can see, it's pretty well known in some southern areas of the state. Um, Slilo prism is the one prism that has no records of hemlock lily adelgid. That's awesome, and we want to keep it that way no records of hemophily adelgid. That's awesome, and we want to keep it that way. So we really need to keep uh, surveying for this invasive species to track its spread. Um, so those red boxes are where hemophily adelgid has been found, and you'll also maybe be able to see some yellow dots. So those are areas where people have surveyed for hemophily adelgid. They found a hemlock tree and they surveyed it and they did weigh. So we really need to keep uh, surveying for this invasive species to track its spread. Um, so those red boxes are where hemophily adelgid has been found. And you'll also maybe be able to see some yellow dots. So those are areas where people have surveyed for hemophily adelgid. They found a hemlock tree and they surveyed it and they did not find hemophily adelgid. So that's really important. So in Slilo, we have some of those not find hemophily adelgid. So that's really important. So in Slilo, we have some of those points. So we know that hemophily adelgid has not been found in those areas. If it was just blank and no one had surveyed there, we wouldn't really know if it indeed was not there or we just haven't noticed it yet. So these not detected records are hugely important. 
And that brings us to IMAP invasives. So sort of to fill all of these needs points, so we know that chemically adelgid has not been found in those areas. If it was just blank and no one had surveyed there, we wouldn't really know if it indeed was not there or we just haven't noticed it yet. So these not detected records are hugely important. And that brings us to IMAP invasives. So sort of to fill all of these needs for understanding invasive species distributions to best know how to manage them, um, New York is using IMAP invasives. So several jurisdictions across North America use IMAP. In New York, we use it as the centralized invasive species database to support PRISMs like FLELO and other state agencies and partners working on invasive species issues. So the big thing is that we serve species distributions and reports. Um, we also have email alerts so for key species. Uh, if you report it in a region, um, people at the state or PRISMs will be alerted that that species has been found so that there can be a really fast response. Um, we also provide web map services and tracking control efforts and results of those control efforts. And so to start this database, we use uploads of existing data from partner organizations and we continuously upload, the, upload these sorts of uh, data sets. So they're from state agencies, uh, nonprofits, museums, et cetera. Um, and these are great, but the thing about invasive species is that their distributions are always changing. So we really need this continuous flow of data. And for that, um, since New York is such a huge state, it's very difficult for one entity to survey the entire thing. We really rely on data entered by community scientists and professionals across the state. And this includes you. So everyone on this call, um, you are all very important to tracking invasive species in New York State, and we're really happy to have you on this call and interested in high mass invasives. And one thing I'll also note is that um, species ID are confirmed by experts. And as I jump in, I want to make sure I make the distinction between the IMAP mobile app and the online web application. So the whole database exists on the web. Um, that's where you can view the data and uh, work with the data. And you can access that through your internet browser. And you can do that on your phone, on your computer, on any other device where you can get internet. And then we also have this mobile app. Um, so since we rely so heavily on community and professional scientists recording invasive species data when they find invasives in the field, we've created this mobile app, which is great for uh, simple data collection. You don't need your internet while you're using it. You just need it to set it up and upload the data, but you can use this app out in the field, um, even if there's no internet connection. And we are going to start with the online web application because that's how you set up your account so that you can use the mobile app. Um, one thing I'll note is that you should use Chrome or Firefox. Um, if you're on your phone, if you're on an iPhone, your default browser might be Safari. So you should just use that in that case. Um, so it's these three browsers that will work. Browsers like Microsoft Edge or Explorer don't work as well. And anyone who does not have an account yet, please feel free to follow along. Um, and even if you do have an account, you can follow along to log in. So if you go to nyimapinvasives.org, either on your phone or your computer screen, you can press this login, create account, either button uh, will bring you to the IMAP Invasives web application. And so this has two spots on it. So if you already have an account, you can log in at the top. So just put in your email that you used and your password. If you haven't logged in in a while, you might need to click this forgot password button. Even if you remember your password, uh, we reset the username and passwords when we moved to IMAP3 last spring. Um, if you don't have an account yet, you use this big sign up box. So this is where you create your account. So you'll put in your information, your name, your email that you want to use, and you'll select New York for your jurisdiction. 
And this will, once you hit join, you'll get an email in your inbox. Make sure to check your spam if you're not seeing anything. In that email, there will be a link that says click here. And it will have a user agreement that you can read through. And when you accept it, you'll be able to log in to IMAP and Basis. I just want to mention that, so that big sign-up box is very inviting, but you only need to use it once. So once you've used it, you don't use that sign-up box anymore, and you go up to the login every time you want to log in. All right, so when you log in, the screen will look like this. Um, if anyone's having any issues getting to this point, please type into the chat box. Um, so it'll look like this. There will be a pop-up for updates. We had an update a few weeks ago. Um, once you get all up to date on what's going on in IMAP, in IMAP Invasives, you can exit that out, and you are here at the main map screen. Just to give you a brief orientation of where everything is on the website, there's the main menu, there's the navigation tools on the left, there's the action tools on the top, and then there's these geographic layers on the right. So there's a lot of cool things you can do on the website. None of them are required to use IMAP Invasives. Um, you can keep it simple and just report species on your mobile app. This is all for if you're interested and you wanna learn more, you can go here. Um, we're gonna focus on the main menu to finish your account setup. So if you click the main menu, um, your account is one of the options. If you click that, it'll bring it to your account page. And this is where um, your information is. And down at the bottom, it has your organizations and projects. So for many of you, these organizations and projects might be blank, especially if you're just setting up your account. And just to briefly explain those in case you're interested, um, Organizations are a way that organizations group data, so they're typically staff only. So if you are recording invasive species as a part of your job, you probably want to join their organization. If you are a volunteer, you don't really need to worry about organizations in most cases. You might be interested in projects. So projects are another great way to group data. Um, some organizations use them for their volunteer efforts, or coordinating volunteer efforts. Um, we use it each year for the IMAP mapping challenge so the volunteers can join the project to be involved. And for those of you on this webinar in particular, there are some projects you might be interested in. So these are the four projects that Megan has set up for the volunteer surveillance network. Um, these are the four species that we'll be covering today. Um, if you already know which of these species you're most interested in, you can join that project now. Um, but we'll also be covering them later, so you, you might uh, decide which ones you want after that. Um, you don't have to join all of these projects, but they're all available to you. So to join a project, you hit that edit button on the top right of your account page. Then you scroll down to the project, and it says request to join a project. Screenshot has organization as an example, but you can just go down to project. Uh, well, I, I, I do believe that's Bob. I have, I have the ability to mute. Uh, can you mute him? Because I, I did text him, but I don't think he noticed. All right, I think I muted everyone. Okay. So where was it? Okay, so you could hit that request to join project button, and then you can type in your project in the box. So type in one of these, Clelo dash, and then the species you're interested in. And then once you type that in, you have to click this request project button again. I sometimes forget that, and I'm like, where's my project? So you just have to make sure you hit that again. And you'll be, you have to make sure you save your changes at the top right. 
then you will be listed as a pending member. And once Megan or someone else from Lilo goes in and accepts you, then you will be a part of this project and you'll be able to tag your records with it when you use the mobile app. Another feature I want to mention are these email alerts. So these were uh, included in IMAP so that state officials and uh, PRISM staff would get would be alerted to observations of new species so that they could have a really rapid response if necessary. Um, but these can also benefit anyone. So I have one for HWA in the PRISM I'm located in. Um, you guys can set up one for HWA or another species you're interested in for uh, the SLELO PRISM. You could also do it for your county. This is a really great way to stay up to date on um, the current distribution. For instance, a few months ago, I got an email alert that there was a new HWA observation in either Fulton or Montgomery County that it hadn't gotten to that point yet. So that was really interesting to see right when it was recorded. And to set those up, you click the email alerts button on the main menu. And there are these general alerts you can opt in and out of. You can also create more custom alerts. So that's how you can do a specific species within a specific geographic area. And this is all optional. You don't have to do this. It's just something I want you to be aware of. All right, and so hopefully everyone has an uh, online account now. If you don't and you're having issues, please enter questions into the chat box. And at this point, we can switch to the mobile app. So again, I hope that you can follow along. So the mobile app is called IMAP Invasive. You can search that in Google Play or the iOS app store and download that. The icon will be that same leaf with the bugs flying around it. And as that's downloading, I want to describe the workflow of the app as a sandwich. So you need connectivity at the beginning to set the account up, sort of the top layer of bread. Um, in the meat of the sandwich, you can go out without connectivity and record invasive species. But then to get these records back into IMAP, uh, you have to go back into connectivity. So we'll start with this setup part. So we're all at home with internet right now, so we can set up our app. If you're opening it for the first time, it'll bring you straight to preferences. If you've opened it before, you'll have to hit that uh, top left button, the three bars, it looks kind of like a hamburger, That's the menu, and then you can select preferences from there. So to start, you want to fill out your information um, the same as you did when you made your account. So select New York for your jurisdiction, enter your email and password, and hit retrieve IMAP list before you scroll down further. And you should get this green message saying that everything worked. Um, if you get a red message, that usually means that your username and password don't match your online account. Maybe type those in again to make sure they work. Um, if you haven't signed into your online account, sign into that again to make sure you have the right password. And sometimes iPhones add a space after your password because they think you're typing a sentence. So just make sure that's not happening. And then, so once you get that green message, you're really all set, but there are also some more preferences that you can set that I want you to be aware of. Um, you can select how you want to look at species names. I think common species, their common name is usually easier to remember than the scientific name. And there's also this cool opportunity to make a, a custom species list. So the species list is hundreds of species long. You have to scroll through them. Um, so one way to avoid that is to pick only the species that you know about, that you're interested in, that you feel comfortable identifying. Um, so this will really make the app easier to use. Um, it'll be really easy to select the species because it'll be a very small list of just species you know about. Um, for instance, for the webinar today, I've selected these species. So I've included fake species. 
sees that all the time for testing to make sure the app's working. And I've also included the, um, the early detection species that Megan's going to be talking about today. And I have those listed in alphabetical order if you want to check those off as you scroll through the species list. Um, there's also this picture quality option. Um, we recommend switching it to 100% for the best quality pictures, but 50% is fine as well. And then the rest, we usually tip, leave those at default values, and that's usually fine. And um, after you join an organization or project, you can select those as projects here. Um, if you're clicking on this project part and trying to add your project that you just joined, you might notice that it's not here yet. Um, that's because you might not have been accepted into the project yet. Um, so in a few days when you've been accepted, you'll have to come back into these preferences and just hit that retrieve IMAP list again. And that sort of re uh, refreshes your account so that it knows that you're part of that project now. And if once you set these default projects, that means you won't have to select them when you're recording an observation. And very important is always remember to save your changes. All right, so now into Meet the Sandwich where we record an invasive species record. So in theory, you could you are now all set to go out into the field, even without internet, and record species that you find. Um, to make sure that that's all working properly, I'm going to ask you all to follow along and sub more, submit a fake species record with me. So on the main IMAP screen, there's this add observation button on the top right. So I'll have you all click that. And then it'll bring you into this screen. So you can take a picture. If you're out in the field, you would take a picture of your hemlock branches or whatever species you're looking at. Um, you can also take a picture that you already have taken in your library. Um, I believe the default is that your custom list will be checked. Um, if it's not, you can check that so that you have a shorter species list. Um, if you happen to be in the field and you find a species that you hadn't added to your custom list, you can always uncheck that so you can see the wider list. And then here's where you select the species. So everyone can select fake species right now to make sure that uh, the app is working for you. And here's where you would select whether or not you found the species that you were looking for. And then as you scroll down, uh, you will see a map. Um, right now, you will probably see the roads and everything around where you live. Um, if you're out in the wilderness without connectivity, this screen may be a blank map, and that's okay. Um, the really important thing is that it is successfully capturing your, lo your location. So below the map, there's that longitude latitude bar, and you should be seeing a nice long string of numbers. If it says zero, zero, that usually means that your GPS is not enabled on your device or your IMAP app is not allowed to access that. So you'll have to go into your phone settings and uh, change that. And then if you scroll down below that, there's some more optional fields. Um, your default projects and organizations you set up will show up there, and this is where you can change them. Um, if you haven't set a default project, you could just uh, choose the project there. Again, um, you'll need to refresh your IMAP list once you've been accepted to the project for these to show up. Um, time searched. So if you were just walking down the trail and happened to find an invasive species, um, you can leave that blank. This is really for if you're doing like a organized search effort for something. And if there are any other comments you feel like we need to know that you weren't able to enter in any of the other fields, you can enter those in here. And then remember to save your changes. And as you're finishing that up, I just want to make a note that the pictures you take are really important when you're uh, making real species records. So on the left, I have some pictures of Hemlock woolly adelgid. 
Um, these pictures are a little bit blurry, so it's hard to tell whether um, there's just snow on these branches or if there are indeed woolly masses at the bases of the needles. Um, if you don't know much about Hemophilia adelgid, Megan's going to talk about that in more detail later. Um, and then on the right, I have a in-focus example where it's much easier to tell. So since everything's in focus, you can zoom in and you can really see the white woolly masses and you can tell very easily that this is indeed hemlock woolly adelgid. So to help you take pictures like this, some tips we have are using a hand. So I have someone's hand behind the branch uh, so that the branch is in focus. You can also use a sheet of paper and this helps your camera focus and also provides some scale. All right, so we've done the first two pieces of the sandwich. Now the bottom slice of bread where we, after you're done with your hike and you get back home, you're back in the internet, you can upload your records to IMAP. So right now, after you've uh, collected your fake species record, it will show up as a yellow card on the main IMAP screen. That means it's on your phone and it is not in the database. So there's this little pencil icon, and you can use that to make any edits or double check your record. Um, and there's also this checkbox, and you can check that if you're done. Once you check that, you can go up to the main menu again. There's this option for upload selected. If you have a bunch of yellow cards, you can also click select all and then hit upload selected. And you will get this uh, box that'll ask you if you really do want to upload them. And if you're ready, you can press OK. And everyone can press OK if you've entered your uh, fake species record. And then once it has gone through, your screen should be blank. Just to reiterate that, if you have a yellow card on your screen, that means the record's in your device and it's not on the online database. If your screen is blank, that means the record has left your phone, but it is on the online database. So it didn't just disappear, it's just moved onto the online database. And another thing I'll mention is that in my first training, my card was red and it would not let me submit it. Um, and so I went into that little edit button to figure out what was going on, and it turns out I forgot to select my species. You just need to select your species if your card is red. Do you have any wipes to be washed? Excuse me one minute. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, that was everything I needed to cover with the mobile app. I hope that everyone was able to submit a species record, a fake species record. So if you are able to do that, you are all set. You don't need to do anything more with IMAP, but if you are interested in what happened to your record, you wanna see where it goes, um, what else is in the database, then you need to go back into the online web application. I'm just checking the time to see how I'm doing. Okay, so I think I do have time to do a really brief uh, show you uh, some of IMAP website. So this is a picture. Yeah. Uh, just, I think if you want to mention, um, there are some chat box questions. So after you do this part, let's pause for a few questions. All right, sounds good. Uh, we can actually do that now because I'm not seeing many records yet, so we can let those trickle through. I'm going to scroll through the chat box real quick. I think in particular, Megan wanted to make mention of a couple of special things for, oh, is that right, Megan? Oh, no, that's fine. I was just putting it in the chat box. Um, I can mention it a little bit later um, if anybody has questions. We'll give them priority. Um, I loved your tip about bring a notebook and um, I have noticed that several people I have looked online and noticed that several people on the webinar have successfully logged in online either this week or today. And um, yes, there will be a follow up email. 
Um, are there any other specific questions to either logging in online or to using the IMAP mobile app? And have you unmuted everyone? Uh, no, everyone is still muted. Um, if you want to. Box. You know, no, no, I hear you chat box. There is one from the chat box. Is there a way to select two jurisdictions? Uh, no, there's not. Do you live on the border of two places or like you collect species data in two jurisdictions? Right, so that is a great question because um, I do uh, interesting. He mentioned the person asking is Jess and they mentioned Southern Maine and New Hampshire. So that's actually a whole different realm. So I live in New York and I have an IMAP mobile account and, and an IMAP online account set up for the state of New York. And we have family in Pennsylvania and go to Pennsylvania a lot. And Pennsylvania is a participating IMAP state. So as long as I change the jurisdiction on my app, I can actually submit species like the place that we go to in Pennsylvania has no hemlock trees left. Um, and I have put lots of um, records into IMAP from Pennsylvania by changing that jurisdiction species. Um, so, in Southern Maine, you could absolutely enter data on the app or online. You just have to change your jurisdiction to the right state because Maine is also a participating state. New Hampshire, I'm not positive about. They were participating and then they weren't, and I don't know if they're on the app or not. Yeah, I can double check that um, during uh, Meg's, Megan's talk on the species. Uh, okay. I don't see anything um, else so, in the chat box at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, so right now I'm only seeing one record pop up in the Syracuse area. So whoever is in Syracuse, go you, it worked. Um, so I'm not going to show the live right now. We can save that for later if uh, anyone's interested. Um, so, if anyone else wants to submit a fake record, uh, please feel free to do so. And I think at this point, um, I just want to make sure you're aware of health resources. Um, so, on our nyimapinvasives.org website, we have recordings of past webinars. Uh, this webinar right now will eventually be put up there. And we have a bunch of help docs and tutorials. And we have um, some species identification materials, including 10 common terrestrial bases. So these are species that you're really likely to encounter. And we also have the IMAP help desk. So you can email me at imapinvasives at dec.ny.gov. And we also have uh, the IMAP network. Uh, so all the jurisdictions across North America that use IMAP, they have a website as well, and there are help, help and resources there as well. And at that point, I will turn it over to Megan Pistolese, Ms. Lilo. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, Slilo Prism spans over 7,000 square miles of land. Plus, we have the vast water resources of Eastern Lake Ontario, the St. Lawrence River, Oneida Lake, and the Indian River Lakes, and Black Lake, and there's probably some more that I'm not thinking of right now. So that's a lot of area to search for invasive species, uh, which is why the efforts of volunteers are so important. So anytime you're on a hike or taking a paddle, we just ask that you keep an eye out for invasive and that you uh, follow the steps that you learned today to report your observations to IMAP. You can go to the next one. Thank you. Mitch showed you this invasion curve earlier, but I wanted to use it to further emphasize the importance of enhancing early detection efforts. So the graph signifies the various stages of invasive species control efforts, and that's based on the population size. So as you can see, there is a direct correlation between the size of an infestation and time. So although preventing a species from invading in the first place is the most effective <laughs> management strategy, 
Um, if invasives are discovered before population sizes grow and spread, it significantly increases our chances of suppressing or possibly eradicating the species. And that's where early detection comes in, that arrow pointing there in this curve. So we currently are strengthening early detection efforts for four priority species, hemlock lily adelgid, spotted lanternfly, tench, and fanwort. These species have either been, not been detected in our region, but have a high spread potential to do so, or they are present in low enough abundance on that invasion curve to suppress or possibly eradicate. I'd like to note that emerald ash borer was one of our early detection species, but since it has, is now considered established in the Slalo region, Efforts for this species have shifted from early detection to more of a suppression and control management strategy. In the next few slides, I'll provide a brief overview of what to look for, the impacts of, and distribution for these early detection species in the Slalo region. We also have a nice invasive species field guide that I can mail you a copy of if you want to email me that you want one um, and give me your address. Uh, the back of this uh, field guide can also be used as a background and scale for photos that you take in the field. And it's small enough to fit in the back of your pocket while hiking, so it's pretty handy. Hemlock lily adelgid, or HWA for short, is an aphid-like insect native to southern Japan. It measures only several millimeters in size, but has a big impact on our forests. HWA feeds on the xylem or nutrient storage of hemlock trees. Over time, infested trees weaken and eventually die between 4 to 20 years, depending on HWA population density and environmental factors. It takes only one female to introduce an infestation, and each female can lay between 50 and 100 eggs, producing two generations a year. HWA can be spotted year-round, but the signs to look for varies depending on the season. So from November to April, you want to look for white woolly masses, hence where it gets its name, hemlock woolly adelgid. These will be present on twigs at the base of the needles. Look underneath the branches when you're standing on the ground. Just look up into the branches and look for these white woolly masses. It will look like tiny cotton swabs. You can see this in the picture on the top left of the slide. And then from May to October, you look for a small black nymph about the size of a sesame seed. They'll be surrounded by white hairs. It looks kind of like a little halo. And you can see this circled in yellow in the middle photo. Infested trees will show symptoms such as loss of crown coverage and a grayish cast as seen in the far right photo. Another sign to look for is the lack of that bright green foliage that you see that just like sticks out like a sore thumb in the springtime at the end of hemlock branches. When HWA is, in, is um, taking the sap out of the trees, it makes it so the tree isn't getting its nutrients and it's not going to be putting out these beautiful bright green shoots in the spring. Oh, sorry, go back one more. Um, HWA can spread over longer distances through movement of infested nursery stock. HWA also spreads naturally in forested land through vectors like wind and birds. and can be found far from urban and suburban areas. Go ahead. Spotted lanternfly or SLF is an invasive plant hopper native to Asia. It was unintentionally introduced in 2014 in Pennsylvania in a shipment of rocks from Asia. SLF feeds on sap of more than 70 plant species, hops, vineyards, nuts, and fruit trees and maples. It is a significant threat to agricultural and tourist industries with over 350 million in grape and apple yields at risk. The appearance of SLF changes depending on its life cycle stage. From instar one through three, the nymphs are black with white spots as you can see from this picture in the bottom right. And then they turn red with black spots just before turning into an adult with very colorful wings that somewhat resemble a moth. SLF are most 
often seen with their wings closed. And they swarm in, in big swarms on host plants, as you can see from the photo on the top right. That's a swarm of SLF on an apple tree. SLF lay their eggs on nearly everything. Their egg masses have a waxy, mud-like appearance and are a grayish color when new, and then the masses turn brown as they age, as you can see on the far left. The excrement or what we call honeydew of SLF causes black sooty mold to build up underneath the plants that they're infesting. You can see that in the middle. The sap may also ooze from the tree trunks due to SLF feeding. On the far right, you can see what that looks like. One of the best ways to detect SLF is to keep an eye out for its favorite host, the tree of heaven, which is also an invasive species. It is also thought that the tree of heaven is needed for SLF to complete its life cycle, but more research is being done to confirm this. Tree of heaven is often found growing in urban areas and unlikely places like alleyways. It has pinnately compound leaves, 10 to 40 leaflets, and an alternate arrangement and bark that resembles the skin of a cantaloupe. Tree of heaven is sometimes confused with sumac or walnut due to its leaf arrangement. And tree of heaven grows fast, grows easily, and it's also allelopathic, which means it toxifies the soil and stops other vegetation from growing nearby. Fanwort is a submerged aquatic invasive plant that is native to South America and southern portions of the United States. It has the capability to grow dense populations that reduce biodiversity and peat recreation and is easily spread by boats. What you want to look for are the leaves that look like a fan, which is where it gets its name, um, fan work from. And then the leaves on the fans, they will have a Y-shaped fork at the end. The leaves are oppositely arranged and attached to the stem by a long petiole. And tench are a freshwater fish native to Europe and Western Asia. They were intentionally introduced through the agri aquaculture trade in many parts of the United States and in Canada. Tench has been present in the St. Lawrence River and Canadian waters for some time now, but has been sighted in the past couple of years within Slevo boundaries. Tench inhibit weedy, muddy water bottoms. They have high reproductive rates, long lifespans, and can survive in low oxygen environments. They are generalist predators whose diet includes fish eggs, snails, and other vestment invertebrates, which puts them into direct competition with many native fish species and desirable sport fish. Tench have the ability to diminish aquatic food webs, increase water turbidity, and introduce non-native parasites into the Great Lakes. Early detection of tench is extremely important in preventing the spread of them into the Great Lakes Basin. So as mentioned earlier, the Slevo region spans over 7,000 square miles of land. To enhance our chances of finding our priority species early, we need to strategize survey efforts. So we collaborated with IMAX Invasives to better utilize the observation data that you all put into IMAP through an interactive story map. And I'm just going to go live and just give you a demonstration of what the story map looks like. Everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Excellent. So the story map is housed on our website underneath the volunteer tab. So this is just on our website, uh, sleeloinvasive.org slash volunteer VSN. Um, if you hover over here and click on this, this is what pops up. So it's housed right there on our website. So you can navigate the story map here. You can click on each of these tabs to open up the information. Uh, this tab here just explains the purpose of the story map. Uh, there's a nice video here about our volunteer surveillance network that you can watch later. Um, and then each of our priority early detection species are featured with general, general information and identification keys 
um, on the top here, and I'll go over them. There's also a nice um, explanation of who Sliwell Prism is and some hyperlinks here to learn more about the PRISM network and our team, and a nice video about our conservation accomplishments and how you can help. I'd like to note that 40% of new invasive species infestations are found like, by people like you who are volunteering to go out there and keep an eye out for our priority invasives. And then there's also a guide here for um, outdoor safety that you can check out as well before you go out in the field more information about IMAP invasives. So getting into the meat of the story map here. So this right here is the information for spotted lanternfly. So the legend here is actually purple dots are showing where Tree of Heaven is. Remember earlier how I mentioned that Tree of Heaven is the preferred host and most likely necessary for the life stages of spotted lanternfly. So spotted lanternfly is not known to be in New York State at this moment. It is known to be in surrounding states like Pennsylvania, and uh, there have been some presence of dead or dead adults or dead apes in New York State. So there there is a high spread potential for the for spotted lanternfly to enter New York State from known quarantine areas nearby. So to enhance the efforts, we're letting folks know to check out their areas here for Tree of Heaven, because it's most likely that it would be on Tree of Heaven if it is present in New York State. So that's why we have the IMAP observations, the confirmed observations for Tree of Heaven here. So you can move the map around just by putting your cursor on it and moving it around. Um, you can zoom in. And as you can see, this is the Sleelo region here. There are some observations. If you click on them, it gives you more information about the IMAP observation, confirmed observation for Tree of Heaven. And you can see here that a lot of our area is showing no record for Tree of Heaven. It doesn't necessarily mean it's not up there. It may mean that maybe we just haven't found it yet. So just keep your eyes peeled whenever you're in um, an urban area for trees that look like this. And then there's also the key to look for for spotted lanternfly here. And a link to our website. If you click on this, it brings you to our website where you can get more details about these species. And then this shows hemlock lily adelgid. There's links here for you to get more information about hemlock lily adelgid and also some suggested survey sites. The green dots. Those are the locations that we're recruiting volunteers to survey for hemlock lily adelgid. So I'll zoom in. And then the purple dots are the confirmed observations. So as mentioned earlier, Lilo is the last region in New York State to not have hemlock lily adelgid confirmed. And these green dots here are indicating the what we like to call highly probable areas that we would like to enhance early detection efforts for hemlock lily adelgid. Most of them are state parks or DEC forests, um, public lands with nice well-groomed trails that would be great for hiking for volunteers. If you click on them, it'll tell you what is the location here. So that's Whetstone Golf State Park, um, Buck Hill State, um, State Forest, and so on and so forth. Forest Park and so on. And then this right here, the suggested survey sites, it just gives you more details for these specific trails and a link to the actual State Forest website or the DEC Wildlife Management um, website to just give you more details about these trails. You can find that there. It gives you background information about hemlock, lily adelgid, everything that I went over in the presentation, what to look for, and again, explains where to look. And then this is the fan wart page. So fan wart was uh, found in Kasag Lake a couple years ago. And Kasag Lake attaches to Fish Creek, and Fish Creek attaches to Oneida Lake. In nature, everything is connected. So um, our early detection team with Slila went out and drove along, I believe this is Route 13, yes, Route 13, and they found easy access areas off of uh, route, thing, route 13 to check uh, Fish Creek for signs of fan work. 
So that's what these green survey, suggested survey sites are showing you here. And you can click on each one and it'll tell you right where to go. So the base of Bridge Road, so on and so forth, Trestle Road. You can click along here and, and just find the different areas that we're hoping people will uh, check out for Science of Fanwort and Fish Creek. And then down here, it just shows you what I've gone over, the identifying characteristics, and where to search for it. And you can get more information about fanwort here. And then the purple dots are, again, IMAP um, confirmed observations for fanwort. And then tench. Um, so tench, as mentioned, it has been in the St. Lawrence River for some time in uh, what we're calling Canadian waters, but still the same water body. Uh, and then recently, in the last couple years, we've noticed that it's starting to move towards Lake Ontario. So the Slilo region is going to encompass this area here in green. And that's where we're asking folks if you like to fish um, on the river, if you just spend a lot of time on the river in general, maybe on some waterfront property, for example, to just keep your eyes peeled for, for tench. Uh, what you're going to want to look for are bright orange or red colored eyes. It has a greenish uh, gold colored scales, uh, rounded dark colored fins, and then the bottom of the fish is more of a light bronze color. And the skin is very slimy, like the texture of an eel. And they can weigh up to 10 to 12 pounds and grow up to 18 inches long. And we're just asking folks to keep an eye out along the St. Lawrence River between Cape Vincent and Messina. And if you do find the fish, uh, we're asking that you don't release it back into the water, that instead you put it on ice. And of course, note your location and report it to IMAP and also um, contact Lilo Prism. So we can uh, confirm that it is tench and uh, put together a response for it. Also, I'd like to note on this page, so this is the Volunteer Surveillance Network page. Uh, down here, if you can join the network if you haven't already done so, this will bring you to a form that you fill out to join. And for those of you who are already part of our Volunteer Surveillance Network, we ask that you just log your time and you can do that right here um, by filling out this form. And of course, if you have any questions about the network in general, please do reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Does anybody have any questions? All right, I can uh, bring back my slideshow for a conclusion and then we can open it up to a longer question period. My PowerPoint will pop up in just a second. All right, so we covered a lot today. I wanted to try to bullet out some main takeaways for the webinar. Um, so from where we started, um, I hope all of you know how to use IMAP invasives, and if you happen to encounter an invasive species, especially one of these four species that Megan has taught us about today, um, I hope you will be able to report them so that um, Slilo and other conservation partners will be able to manage these species. Um, you should also be familiar with some early detection species in Slilo. Uh, we hope that you now know how to use the VSN story map and understand what it provides. So you can use it for species ID information. You can use it to see the distribution of species. And this is all um, live data from IMAP. So if someone finds Kench today, it'll show up in this, uh, <clears throat> in this story map in real time. And this VSN also the CSN story map also has outlined some areas where you can survey for these species. And that's really helpful for figuring out where to look for these species in Lilo, which is a large region. And so hopefully with all those takeaways, um, anyone who's interested will be able to go out this weekend and survey for one of these species that they're interested in. 
so with that, um, I'll open it up to questions. So I have uh, my contact information and website and then Megan's uh, contact information and website so that you can follow up with either of us if you have any more questions or comments. Um, you can enter questions into the chat box. And I also think our group is small enough that if anyone wants to verbally ask questions, we could do that too. Um, on the right, I have some of IMAP's upcoming webinars. Um, we have the IMAP Invasive Species Mapping Challenge in June. And then at the end of May, we also have this water chestnut uh, webinar focused on how to record water chestnut poles in IMAP. Um, you can register for those on our website. And also go to the Slilo website because they always have great events going on too. I know not, not as many in-person events right now, uh, but still check in to see what's going on there. Um, so yes, any questions either about IMAP or about the species or the story map? Thank you all for joining as well. We're very happy that you've all joined us this morning. <laughs>